Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so excited to see such a big audience and so excited to see so many people that I've communicated with over video, chat, and email that I can now talk to in person. So very, very nice. I'm talking today about Google's investments in Beam. And so first, a little bit about myself. I've turned off the projector. So my name is Kerry, and I am an engineering manager at Google. And right now, I manage about 2 thirds of the Beam team covering IOs, Python, ML workflows, uh, data flow templates, and Go. Yeah. This is a picture of me at work back when work was in my house. Those kittens are much bigger now, and they still both want to ride on my shoulders, but if they do, it results in a literal cat fight on top of my head. So I try to avoid that. This is me at home. I live in the woods in North Carolina with my six children and my wife, who's just moved to the Flume team. So we get to work tightly together. You can tell that I'm a software engineer because I can't resist showing you a picture of my children representing two different data structures. In the one case, we have a list ordered by height and sorted. In the other case, we have an unordered set referenced by a single pointer, which is me. The second picture makes a little more sense if I tell you that my old job, I was a circus performer and I had a circus school and performance company. So I can literally put ringmaster on my resume, and I do so whenever possible. <laughs> but of course, today we're here to talk about Beam. Now, I joined the Beam team in November of 2021, and it really struck me how Beam can do so many things in a different way than many other data processing approaches. First, of course, is the fact that Beam has a unified model. And when I say a unified model, I mean a unified model for both batch and streaming workloads. Now, this intuitively made a lot of sense to me because I don't believe that there are really any cases where someone wants to delay the processing of their data till the next day. It's just that technology often means you start out with a batch workload that you're running, say, nightly because of resource constraints. And then as you get more resources, you may run those batches more frequently and at a shorter time interval. And so, of course, the natural conclusion of this pattern is to move to streaming and real-time processing. A nice thing about Beam is that it supports you through that whole piece of progress, moving from batch workflows at an interval to streaming workflows in real time without having to change the fundamental technology you're using. Another thing I thought was really interesting about Beam was the approach of having many SDKs. So that here we're really trying to meet the developer where they're at instead of making them come to us in our paradigm. So right now we have, of course, Java, our great granddaddy SDK, Python, and very, very recently, a fully featured Go SDK as well. I'm also going to talk a little bit about our TypeScript SDK, which is currently experimental. Finally, there's portability. So Beam doesn't just let you pick your SDK, but also lets you pick where you want to run your pipeline. Of course, as a Google employee, I think Dataflow is a really good choice. But there are other choices. You have Flink, Spark, Hazelcast, which I was at the uh, Python or the uh, Kafka conference in London. And I went over to the Hazelcast booth, because they were next to our Google booth, and said, hey, what do you guys do? And it just tickled me pink that they showed me, here's our, our one workflow, but we also have this, this open source standard runner that uses this thing called Beam. And it was 
cool to see them presenting that, having no idea that that was you know, my, my day job, as something that was an open standard and that they considered that important enough to implement that in their runner. We also have Ray and Dask runners under development now. And I think you can hear a, a talk about the Ray runner later. And the Dask runner is very, very recent. And I'm excited to see where that goes. But so altogether, this means that, that Beam is really trying to be flexible and not to be prescriptive in terms of the tools that you use. Now, of course, working at Google, I also get to see how Beam is used inside Google. And it's actually a, a vote of confidence, I think, in the product that I can look at such different areas inside Google as DeepMind, YouTube, or Waze, as well as things like Vertex AI and Dataplex inside Google Cloud. Now, these are independent business units, so there's no command that they need to use Beam. But they've found Beam useful for a wide variety of use cases throughout the company. And of course, that tells me that Beam can support things truly at Google scale. Now, Google is also investing heavily in Beam. This is a graph of the number of engineers working full time on Beam starting in January 2021. And you can see that it makes a nice straight line. Now, that means in software, we expect that either this is a, a linear curve, and so by 2100, we'll have more than 100 people working on Beam, or it's a hockey stick. And a significant fraction of the world's population will work on Beam at Google by 2100. We'll just have to wait and see. The Beam team at Google, I've gathered as many people's pictures as I could. You'll see many of these faces in upcoming talks or in the audience around you. But I'm very excited. About two thirds of the team now is in Durham, North Carolina, and the remainder in Seattle and Sunnyvale. Now, Beam itself, with all of these people working on it at Google, is making significant strides forward. One thing that I'm very pleased to see is multi-language pipelines. So this means that even though you're working in one SDK, you're able to take advantage of transforms in other SDKs. We see this as a way to bring the work that people have done, say in Java, on IOs, to our newer SDKs, say Go or Python. And it also allows a new SDK to develop more quickly because you don't have to implement every transform to maintain parity with the Beam model or have access to IOs. And we were a little surprised that that seems to also be needed the other way. So instead of just Java with the richest transform library being used in other SDKs, we've seen requests for Python transforms, for example, machine learning transforms, to be used in Java pipelines. So this is very exciting. Work is still ongoing, but right now you can use Java transforms in Go or Python pipelines, and we're working on allowing those transforms to be used in Java pipelines. Okay. I am not a fluent user of this control. So I have a rebus riddle for the audience. You know, a rebus is where you represent an English word or phrase with a series of pictures. So here's my pictures. Do I have an audience guess what these represent? English phrase. Yes. Oh, I saw a hand. Oh, sorry, I was looking through them. I see a screen and I see a screen, but I'm not there. <laughs> okay. Well, there's two more things. Stream, beam. Yes. Streaming, beam, go, launch. I'm fluent in pictures. In fact, that is something that I'm very happy to announce, is that the Go SDK now fully supports streaming operations. Woohoo! <laughs> this launch announcement is simultaneously late and early because it launched in Beam 2.40, which is already out, and it is supported on Dataflow on Wednesday, July 20th. 
So I think this is something that's been a long time coming, and I'm really excited about how we've accelerated progress on the Go SDK, largely due to that growing Beam team. You can learn more about how Beam is going in new directions at oh hush. <laughs> at Robert's talk, or you can learn about writing streaming pipelines in Go at Danny and Jack's talk. And Robert's talk's today at 2, and Danny and Jack, Tuesday at 4.15. Another thing that we are trying out in Beam is supporting the growing interest in machine learning. So, of course, everyone in the industry knows that machine learning is the hot new thing. And it's been the hot new thing pretty steadily for about the past eight or 10 years. We think Beam is a great fit for machine learning inference. Because in a machine learning workflow, once you've developed a model, you want to deploy that model very often in a batch or streaming context. So that when data comes in, you can use a Beam pipeline to process that data, for example, tokenizing it, padding, transforming, then you can call a model for inference on that data, get the inference back, and continue with your pipeline. So we are proud to say that we now support this in Beam Python with our run inference transform. Now, run inference has a base transform that can be extended for the machine learning framework of your choice. We're launching with support for PyTorch, TensorFlow, and scikit-learn models in your pipeline. And also, NVIDIA is contributing to Beam, uh, PR currently in review, support for their TensorRT framework which allows you to load a model that's been compiled to the Onyx model standard. So we're very excited about this. Of course, it works on uh, workloads running on NVIDIA GPUs. You can hear more about run inference, the development of it, and how it's being deployed in Andy's talk. And run inference is also live in Beam, Beam 2.40, and it's live on Google Dataflow, also on Wednesday. July 20th, and there's the, the long link. You can type quickly. You can check out the repo, and if you have a framework that you like that's not there, this is very extensible, and we encourage you to contribute. Another way that Beam is going in new directions is by adding new SDKs, and this is, of course, a challenge. It's a big project, but in January this year, we had an internal hackathon. And I'd been tossing around the idea that I thought TypeScript would be a great thing to implement as a Beam SDK. Luckily, Robert Bradshaw agreed with me. And if you followed the Beam repo, you know that if, if Robert Bradshaw wants to do something, it'll probably get done. So we collected a team of seven engineers. We worked for a week, and at the end of the week, with only a little bit of fakery, we could run a word count pipeline in a TypeScript SDK. So this was just a, a tremendous accomplishment. Robert had said it's relatively easy to build a new SDK, but none of us believed him until it happened. So the TypeScript SDK is now checked in to the Beam repo as experimental. And you might ask, why did we choose TypeScript instead of, say, Rust, which is the SDK that is number one most requested by Google engineers. The answer is it might be awesome to code in Rust, but many, many, many more people are currently able to code in JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, JavaScript doesn't fit our Beam needs, but TypeScript, it turns out, does and actually can fit them in a way that was surprisingly easy for many aspects of SDK development. Where's TypeScript going from now? Well, that depends on you. We developed this as a hackathon project, polished it, merged the PR, and it works. But of course, it's far from a fully featured SDK. 
And on the team, we lack the deep TypeScript knowledge to really produce an idiomatic, full-featured TypeScript SDK. So if this sounds interesting, if you have TypeScript developers that you think could do a good job building your pipelines, come on over. We'll be happy to review PRs and extend the capabilities of this SDK as time goes forward. Now, we're not just working on adding features to Beam. We're also trying to make Beam easier to use and easier to learn. So we've been working with our partners at Equilon to develop the Beam Playground. The Beam Playground is a way for a user to skip past all of the setup and installation necessary to get Beam up and running. Here, a user can define in a web interface a Beam pipeline in the SDK of their choice. You have three choices still. But you don't need to run it on your local machine. So you can run a pipeline, you can inspect the output, and this is all available on the Beam Playground. Daria is going to be doing a follow-up talk on the Beam Playground, if you're interested in this. This will be at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. I encourage you to attend. In addition to the Playground, if you're a GCP customer, you can also experiment with Jupyter Notebooks for Beam Pipelines. So this runs on Google Cloud. You can provision notebook instances. You can inspect your output. And we give you a lot of tools to share that knowledge with the rest of your team. And we have example pipelines that you can inspect and modify as well. Finally, we're taking this one step further. And inspired by the Beam Katas, we're going to launch later this year also in partnership with Aqualon, a tour of Beam, which I have shamelessly ripped off from a tour of Go. When I got a job and had to learn Go quickly, a tour of Go helped me immensely. And I thought, Beam is a difficult structure to learn, and it can be difficult to learn how to build a pipeline. So why don't we have something like a tour of Go for Beam? Luckily. This resonated, and we are developing this right now, leveraging the Beam Playground, so that we have structured examples of Beam, Beam usage, Beam transforms in Java, Python, and Go, all three SDKs, and users will be able to follow this learning path and save and track their progress. So I'm very excited, and we plan to launch the first chapters of this later in 2022. Now, there's also the aspect of contributing to the Beam repo. As an open source project, ideally, we want contributing to our repo to be smooth and easy. However, there's some friction. I was surprised when I joined the team and I wanted to add an issue, and I couldn't because our Beam Jira was locked down, and you had to be a get contributor permissions to the Jira to create an issue. So you can see the mailing list was full of mails that are just, hi, hey, I need contributor access. Hi, hey, I need contributor access. This took a lot of time from our committers and was a step, a friction step, to actually participating in the Beam project. Well, we don't have that friction anymore. Thanks to the hard work of Danny McCormick on our team, we have moved from Jira to GitHub issues. And this allows users to more easily contribute issues. And it also allows those issues to be integrated with other GitHub tooling to automate processes. As part of that migration, we cleaned up our labels. And that was a huge help in discoverability of issues. So if you haven't checked out the project in a little while, I recommend take a look, make sure your issue of choice was migrated correctly and is labeled well, and enjoy the ease with which you can now create new issues in the project. Another Danny contribution was a PR bot. And this is amazing because formerly you could submit a PR and especially if you're an outside contributor, you may not have any idea who's the right person to review your change 
or committer to merge your change. But by automating this process, we now have the advantage that you can submit your PR and the PR bot will assign you a reviewer, a correct reviewer based on what your change is or someone who can review, and also track the progress of that PR through review and eventually assigning a committer for merge. Of course, you can override this behavior if you have a reviewer you prefer, but we believe this will really help spread the review load across the team and also increase the velocity of PRs in the project. And I had to update this slide because when I made the slide last week, the PR bot was only turned on for part of the repo and it was actually fully merged. The PR bot is now on for all PRs as of Friday, I think. So thank you, Dan. So in conclusion, Google is making a growing investment in Beam. We're helping Beam to grow in the terms of its features with multi-language pipelines, the Go SDK, run inference and machine learning applications in Python, and our new TypeScript SDK. We're trying to make it easier to learn Beam with the Beam Playground, Cloud Notebooks, and a tour of Beam. And we're trying to make it easier to contribute to Beam with our GitHub issues migration and the PR bot. Finally, this represents the work that the team has done roughly in the last year. And with the growth of the team, we're still bringing new team members up to speed, which means I'm very excited about what I'll be able to announce next year in the next version of this talk. Thank you all very much.